have a key if you take your door key and try and open my house. It's not going to open. Why? Because the key was designed for that particular keyhole to open it up. Design always opens destiny. That, therefore, if there are certain things that you are struggling for or trying to make happen in your own flesh, maybe, just maybe, you should not be working on life as hard as you should be working on self. Abraham Lincoln put it this way, if there's a tree in front of me, I would rather spend 20 minutes sharpening the edge of my axe than I would hacking away at the tree. In the same way, there are certain things in life that we can't cut through because we're not sharp enough. And so when you deal with the law of design, you're dealing with something that opens up the door of destiny. Your design determines so much, but we are in a world that questions design. We question design to meticulous details. We question design so badly that things that should be common sense are no longer common sense anymore. We, we are able to question design for one simple reason. You get rid of God, you get rid of creation. You get rid of creation, we're an accident. If we're an accident, you can question everything about us. But see, I can't take my mobile phone and use my mobile phone, put my mobile phone in a toaster. Or I can't take this drum, uh, this, uh, this microphone. Last week I took my microphone and I used it on the drums. And you all looked at me, I'll stand and why? Because even you knew this simple thing called a microphone is designed. Yet as complex as you are, you don't believe you're designed. You were designed, you were made meticulously. And just because you use yourself for the wrong thing doesn't mean that's who you are. This is what we call abuse. And a lot of you are guilty of self-abuse. Abuse comes from two words, uh, abnormal and use. That means you are using yourself abnormally. Every single time you fornicate, you are abnormally using yourself. Every single time you lie, you are abnormally using yourself because you are going against the grain of your design. So this is why we wonder when we fornicate, we're like, I'm just living life to the full. And then you've got a string of heartbreaks. You can't stay committed to a relationship anymore. You get married and you're looking at other people. Why? Because somewhere in your life journey, you abuse the law of design. And that's what sin is all about. It's about getting us to engage in our passion over our design. You got to be careful. Anytime you are tempted, you are tempted against what you are designed for. You were not designed for pornography. You were designed for meaningful relationships. So every time you watch pornography, you feel terrible because something inside of you is preaching to you called your conscience, telling you this is not the design. Your design determines so much. Your design determines what church you go to. Your design determines where you live. Your design determines who you marry. This is why you cannot find a man till you've discovered your design. You can't afford to marry out of love. I lost some of you there. You can't afford to marry out of love. You've got to marry out of desire. You're looking at me funny because all of a sudden you're in that relationship. You were just so in love with him, but you did not discover his design. But you are in love with him. And after a while, he's going against your design. You know you were meant to speak and preach all over the world, but he's telling you he needs you to be a housewife. And because you did not understand your design, you abuse yourself by merging with something that does not fit your design. I can get an iPhone, my iPhone, and put, what's the latest iPhone? iPhone X, my wife's one. Sometimes I put her case on my phone. And when I put her case on my phone, my phone only has two cameras, hers has four. So her case has the four camera space. Why do I sometimes do it? Because it has a magnet on it and it works on the sat now. 
So, so I sometimes put that case on my phone, and my phone keeps falling out of the case. Why? Because it wasn't designed for it. Some of you are falling out with people that you're not designed for. Design determines everything. Everything. The church you go to is not because your parents went there or their parents went there. You are uniquely designed. If I take pineapples and try and grow them in the United Kingdom, it won't work because those pineapples were designed for a particular environment. And in that environment, they come alive. How do I know what church I should go to? When you got into the environment, something in your spirit came alive. That was your design. And some of us shut down our design and retreat back to religion. Because design always determines what you're responsible for. And some of you want to avoid your design because if you know that you're designed, you become responsible. And if there's anything we like to shirk in the West, it's responsibility. Design determines what you value. Design determines so many things. It determines so many things. It's the first key to success. Design determines environment. Design is the reason why a fish doesn't go on land. My brother says it like this, because design does determine who you marry. He says a monkey and a fish can get married, but where will they live? Your design determines your friendships, your associations, who you hang around with, who you don't, how much time you spend with certain people. It's all determined by the law of design. And without the discovery of design, you will always abuse yourself. Always. And without the discovery of design, your life will always be frustrating. How do I know when I've discovered my design? No more frustration. Frustration is the sign that you are not following the design. Frustration is the first indicator that you're not following the law of design. If I take a Lamborghini and take that Lamborghini off-road, the Lamborghini will struggle, but put it on the road and it will whiz through the air. But take a Land Rover off-road and it will manage why it was designed for it. There's certain things you're frustrated with life about because you're doing very things you're not designed for. That job you're in, perhaps... Perhaps you're not designed for it. That house you live in is too small. Amen. Perhaps you're not designed for it. And design is not an evolution. Design is a discovery. Life is all about discovery. We're spending so much time and money and resources in the world looking for the meaning of life. Men have dug down to the earth. They've dug under the ocean. They've reached the planets. And they still come back confused. And yet God hid the mysteries of the universe in the only place he knew we wouldn't look. In here. It's called Christ in us, the hope of glory. Concealed on the inside of us is something very powerful. It is our design. It's our answer. Which is why when I see the abortion crisis, and some of us are casual about it, it irritates me to the bone. Especially when you bring up the argument, when does life begin? Because the real question is not when does life begin. It is when does potential begin. Because I don't know yet. We've been praying for the cure to cancer, but we may have killed the cure to cancer. We may have killed. Imagine if Martin Luther King was aborted. Imagine if uh, Mother Teresa was aborted. Imagine if Albert Einstein was aborted. Every single person born is a contributor to the mystery called life. And every single time we kill our contributors, we end up in mystery and we end up in confusion and the world is frustrated. Basically, if you don't discover you, I stay in darkness. 
Stop trying to win friends, first win yourself. Stop trying to find people who are like you when you don't even like you yet. Stop discovering who you are. Stop comparing. Start to find out who God made you. I got news for you. You will never be Beyonce. Let me help some of you. Sasha Fiercest in the church. You will never be Beyonce. You will never be Rihanna. Some of you men will never be Bill Gates. You'll never be Michael Jordan. You'll never be Tyler Perry. They've done it. They've done it. They succeeded at being themselves. The only game you can win is the game of being you. When you discover yourself, you play by your own rules, and you always win a game when it's your rules you're playing by. Some of you are trying to sing. You You can't sing. I'm so glad we have Pastor Sam because before now, some churches you go to the choir, they'll allow, come as you are. Anyone come. And then you come and sing on the choir. And everyone's harmonizing, but you're the only one we can hear. You've got all kinds of H factors, D factors, <laughs> accents. Ray, Jesus, Ray. Ray. You. Medairo. When my back was back in the wall, and it looked as if it was over, you made that But before you get into the choir here, Pastor Sam will audition you. Oh, but on your spiritual, is it about the Holy Ghost? It's about the Holy Ghost. It is. And the Holy Ghost loves your voice by yourself without a microphone. We, on the other hand, are not the Holy Ghost. We can hear you. And I'm trying to engage in the presence of God. And while I'm trying to, you're, going, you're even singing the wrong songs. Have you ever done it? You close your eyes and someone in the choir goes off. You go. I do it all the time from the front row. They always sing like. Or someone gets pitchy because they try to reach a note that they weren't designed for. And they go, woo And just open your eyes. You were designed for something. Your design is hidden in your frustrations. Your design is hidden in your tears. Your design is hidden in your pleasures. Your design is hidden in your reactions. We can watch the same TV show and I'll cry and you won't. Because design is hidden reactions. You know, in TV shows, the only moment I cry is when a father connects back with his son. Because I was born to restore the hearts of sons back to the fathers. So in movies, when I see that happen, something in me wells up because I was designed for it. You might look at me and say, sissy, man up. But on the inside, I was designed for it. You might see somebody singing on stage and something in you rises up because you were designed for it. You might see somebody making a medical breakthrough and something in the inside of you rises up because you were designed for it. Part of your design is what inspires you. What moves you. The second law, we talked about design. The next law I want to talk about that determines excellence is the law of desire. Probably the most powerful law of all the laws after design, because design and desire are married. In fact, everything I'll teach you is married to your design. Design and desire are married. Desire is your ability to make your design contagious. Have you ever met somebody with great character but no charisma? You rarely catch such a person. Have you ever heard somebody speak? Maybe you have them in university, the monotonistic lecturer. Everybody, let's, imagine if I spoke like this. Um, let's pray. Some of you just fall asleep even with all my energy. <laughs> even with every energy in me, shouting, speaking. I see you, the noddies in the church, the, the Churchill dogs in the church. Desire is, the, it, desire is exactly the same as fire in the realm of the spirit. Exactly the same. I woke up in the middle of the night 
with this, uh, I had this encounter in my dream. And in my dream, I saw God. Don't ask me what he looked like. But he said to me, Light London needs a prayer movement and it's time to burn. Oh, and I woke up praying in tongues, crying, Robert Messiah. And I knew it was the Holy Spirit. Without desire, we don't become contagious. Without desire, we don't burn. And some of you, at some point in your life, had the ability to burn, but you burnt out. And I will show you today how to reignite yourself again. Because you've got to live life on fire. To this extent, a revivalist once said, God, douse me in your kerosene and set my life on fire that the world will see me burn. You can't afford to live life casually. Life is more vehement against you. You've got to have a fire inside you when it comes to living life. Somebody said to me, because I'll teach you one day about the law of discipline. Never choose discipline, choose desire. Desire will always decide discipline. Linford Christie runs a race. Oh, uh, he, he tanked out. Um, um, give me a new name. Usain Bolt runs a race. He doesn't eat hamburgers. He doesn't eat pizza. If you sat with him, he's eating some, some, some vegetables and, 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 and maybe a bit of protein on the side whilst you're eating hamburgers and you're wondering why your life is in discipline because what he did was he connected to his desire. And what was his desire? To stand on that stage while they put a gold medal around his neck. And he gets to put his hands up for his country. The Bible says it like this. For lack of vision, my people cast off restraint. When you cannot see the goal line, you can't see the desire or the passion. The Bible says about Jesus in Hebrews, it says he, 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 fors- he, 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 he kept his eyes on God. It says he despised the shame and the cross because he looked forward. What was he looking forward to? You and I. Why did Jesus endure the cross? Desire. Desire makes pain meaningful. Desire, I'll say that again, makes pain meaningful. This is why God showed up to the children of Israel. And he said this, children of Israel, I'm setting you free. And what I'm doing is I'm giving you a land of your own, flowing with milk and honey. What was God trying to do? Awaken desire. But he didn't say that to Pharaoh. Because when it comes to God, let me tell you something about God. God will never tell you about the process. I'm helping some of you. Because if God told some of you what you would go through, God will tell you you're going to be a millionaire. But he won't tell you about the bills, the creditors, the accountants you need, the business plan you need to set up. The lawyers you need, the legal staff you need, the ability to wake up earlier. You need to organize yourself. You need to work harder than somebody in a job. Somebody asked me, how many hours do you work? I said, sun up. Sun up. (laughs) You know, God's going to make me a millionaire, so God told me to leave my job. (laughs) Come. And this is where I'm going to talk about waking his eye. How many remember chemistry? Do you remember chemistry in school? There was a triangle. Do you remember the combustion triangle? Some of you slept through that class. Let me remind you. Because you're looking like, yeah, yeah. You don't want to look dumb. So you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I gave you this mic and said to you, yeah, 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 what was it? You'd be like, what is a combustion triangle? I hope even I remember. What is a combustion? Combustion triangle shows you what it takes to have a fire. What it takes for fire to burn are three things. 
and it's wrapped up in the combustion triangle. Oh, they know it. It means fuel. Fire means fuel. You're going to realize why some of you burnt out. You were excited about certain things before until you realize how much fuel this fire needs. And there are various fires that life will light. One of the fires is the fire of romance and love. And some of you are wondering where the love went in your marriage. It needs fuel. Fire needs heat. If the temperature outside of a fire becomes cooler than the fire, the fire goes out. Fire needs heat. That's why Australia's fire is still burning. They've got a problem. It's a hot country. In the UK, it would have gone out by now. Our fire would have just gone, I'm out. (laughs) Because fire needs heat. What's the third thing fire needs? Oxygen. It needs air. Can I help you today? Can I help all of you today? To activate the fire for life again? To activate the fire for the Holy Spirit and the presence of God that you lost a long time ago? Because some of us during services, uh, I remember a pastor friend of mine commented, I'm going to get name and shame, Pastor Chido commented on one of my videos. I panned the whole church during a praise service on my Instagram. And he wrote to me, he said, doesn't it annoy you that everyone's praising, but there's always that one. He said, that one who's like Mount Zion, I shall not be moved. And yeah, everyone's, ah, you are great. Yes, you are. Mighty God. And you got Haley. And you got, yay. You got, and everyone's enjoying themselves. Then you got this one person. That's like, and it's just to a sway, a polite sway, just, to, just so you leave them alone. Fire needs those three things to burn. Fire needs fuel. Fire needs heat, and fire needs oxygen. Let's go through those, and let's look at every area of your life. Let's start first with your relationship with God. What is the fuel of your relationship with God? I find that actually the fuel is the heat, and it's the oxygen all at the same time. What's going to keep... Your marriage burning. What's going to keep your business? After this many years in business, with every setback we've had to overcome, everything we've had to battle through, I'm still here burning with a passion for business. I don't start things and then stop. I finish. Because desire determines what you finish. It's easy to start. Desire determines what you finish. Some of you were put off by life a long time ago. Your fire went out a long time ago. You're you're existing, but you're not living. You're going through life casually. You're doing what they call coasting through life. You know when you coast, I think it's only possible to do it in a manual car, right? I can't even remember how you coast. What, What do you do to coast? I haven't driven a manual in a long time. Huh? You take it out of gear. It's in neutral. I just let it roll. Some of you do it because you can't afford petrol. You just want to, it's just like, oh, my God. <laughs> you just tap and hope you hit a downhill coast. Some of us are coasting through life. Even your car will tell you without fuel it will go out. Anything that does not have fuel goes out. What does it take to fuel your life in God? This fire that we have in God. How do we create it? Because I'll tell you what, a prerequisite of God is heat. God will not accept anything that does not have heat. It makes him sick. In Revelation, he put it like this. He said, you are neither cold nor hot. You are lukewarm. So I spew you out of my mouth. So when you come to a church and you think, well, it doesn't take all of that. It takes all of that. It takes all of that. If there's no intensity, there can't be destiny. Because destiny requires penetration. It requires focus. It requires force. And if you don't have intensity, you don't have intentionality. You need it. You need all yourself gathered, not dispersed, not two souls, not a a schizophrenic. You need everything you are in one place. Desire determines focus. It creates discipline. 
and desires like fire. Anything a fire gets around, it burns and consumes. And the level of your desire determines your success in life. When I see people give up, all I can say to myself is this, they didn't want it bad enough. That's the truth. Success is absolute when you've decided you're going to die for something to happen. Success will always happen when you have determined in your heart that you desire this thing more than your life. Success is inevitable to those who have a burning desire for it. Who am I talking to in this room? I, I, I need to know who I'm talking to. Success is inevitable when there's desire. And when there's desire, the evidence of it is company. Because certain people cannot handle the fire of desire. Actually, when uh, Paul got onto the Isle of Patmos, a poisonous snake, uh, not the Isle of Patmos, uh, a certain island after a shipwreck, a poisonous snake leaped out. He started to make a fire and a poisonous snake leaped out of the fire. When you make a fire, snakes leap out. Oh, man, you're missing this. Because you thought that they were your friends. You thought that you were carrying them on the journey. But you start to make a fire. Some of you calmed your fire down because you didn't want to upset the snakes. Some of you are sitting next to them now. You dumbed yourself down in your marriage because you didn't want to. You stupefied yourself because you didn't want to upset your friends. You started to even talk like they talk just because you wanted to maintain your social circle. You know you were made for beyond, but your company determines your cap. I need to say that to this side of the room. Your company determines your cap. Your company determines your ceiling. Your company determines how high. Your company determines your capacity. You cannot go beyond your company. Impossible. It will never happen. Beyond those who you're surrounded with. In fact, if I took 10 of your friends and got their income together, I can calculate your income level by the average of your friends. Man, if you want to go up, you've got to unfriend. You missed that revelation. If you want to go up, you've got to unfriend. Stop accumulating friends. They're not your friends anyway. Those are people who are just watching, waiting for you to fall. They look at your pictures and swipe by them. They don't celebrate you anyway. Notice when you've done something good, you didn't see their like there. Hello, somebody. But we live in a world where we like to perform. Without design, you perform. And performance always happens when you're trying to act like something you're not. Or when you're trying to act like something you are. You just haven't discovered it yet. Okay. So how do we get this heat going? How do we reactivate ourselves? Well, first of all, you've got to discover how you're deactivating yourself. See, God said to the children of Israel, let my people go that they may. He didn't say that to the children of Israel. He said that to Pharaoh. Let my people go that they may worship me. To the children of Israel, he said this. Hey, guys, you're going to a land filled with milk and honey. You tell me like, God's like, what do you want? I just want you, man. Even God, does not rep <laughs> Even God does not consider himself to be the finishing. In fact, he said the Holy Spirit is a down payment and a deposit, a guarantee of what's to come. Yeah. Yeah. Going, God, well, God, God's like, what do you want? I just want you, God, nothing else. I just want you. Even God looks at Adam and said, it's not good for you to be alone. Because God created man with certain desires and appetites and wants and needs and things that you want on the inside of you, right? But what religion tells you to do is shut down. Yet, God said, whatsoever things you desire, prayer 
is not the place for needs. Man, I'm preaching better than this church is saying amen. I need to find somewhere else to talk. Prayer is not the place for needs. Prayer is the place for desires. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them. Some of you are boring God because you are only talking about needs. Needs are always about survival. And in Matthew the 6th chapter, when they started to talk about their needs, he said, we don't have clothes, we don't have things to eat. Jesus said, even the lilies of the valley are clothed. They don't ask God. The sparrows that neither toil nor spin, got not one sparrow falls to the ground without your father knowing. Oh, you of little faith. Your faith is wasted on your needs. Faith is for the impossible. Faith is for desires. How do I activate myself when I'm switched off? How do I switch myself back on? How do I get back to this place where I'm hot for God, where I'm alive in life? What's the time? Is it time to close? What's the time? What time do I finish? Huh? Okay. What's the place where I'm burning for God? How do I get that desire back? Are you all listening? Are you all here? How do I get that burning back? It's going to be a choice. You're going to have to make a choice. A decision. And the decision is going to be difficult. I looked at the life of the children of Israel. And I thought... When I saw how they behaved, I thought these people are mentally incapacitated. I thought they were stupid beyond belief. I really judged them. And I thought something was wrong with them. But something in their lives, just imagine, for generations, It being ingrained into you generationally. This helps me with the church. When I'm telling you guys, launch businesses, do exploits, I see why you don't. Because for generations, these guys have been in Egypt. The word Egypt in Hebrew means to limit. And they were not just physically abused. They were verbally abused. They were sexually abused. Imagine being whipped and being called by a number and not by a name. Imagine your very identity being stripped of you in a place called Egypt. Israel, the name Israel means contender with man and God and have prevailed. This is the job of the preacher, to remind you that you're Israel. You contend with man, you contend with God, and you have overcome. It's our job as preachers to remind you of who God says you are. But Egypt, the world out there, is going to tell you, no. Oh, man, you are unlimited. You are, you can do anything. You can become anything. You can literally, you have so much capability. Some of you are even offended by this. How dare he give us hope? See, God came to prophesy to the children of Israel. You're going to a land flowing with milk and honey. Why? Because a fire needs oxygen. The oxygen of the believer is hope. What are you hoping for? If you don't have hope, you can't have faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means when I have hope, you'll see the evidence of my hope in how I behave. That means faith is design. Oh, you missed that. You missed that. Faith is design. Hope is destiny. You missed it. This is why God said to Abraham, you're about to have a child, hope, that's in the future. 
But faith says, change your name right now. <laughs> so your future can recognize you. That's why some of you are like, I don't have a job. Well, wake up in the morning and put on a suit anyway. Because when you've got faith, you start acting in ways. When you've got faith, you start acting like your hope. When you've got faith, you start acting like your destiny. When you've got faith, all your friends say, calm down. You ain't got that much in your bank account. Why are you acting like that? But when you've got, when you've got faith, I can see faith. I can see where you're going by how you're acting right now. I can predict your future by your present behavior. Oh man, I wish you could get this. It needs, it needs hope to come alive. If without hope, oh, that's why we need dreamers more than ever in the church. We need people who, who really believe. We need, we need, we need, sorry to use this term if it offends your sensitivities. We need more than dreams. We need dream catchers in this church. We need people who won't allow the dreams to keep going to the house of the wicked. We need people who will say, as Christians, we're not just going to build churches. We can build hospitals and orphanages. We're not just going to keep preaching behind a pulpit when parliament is empty of our presence. We need Christians who occupy places in government. We need dream catchers. We need people who will catch the thoughts of God. Isaiah was a dream catcher because God was just in heaven minding his business, speaking at his altitude. See, God always speaks at his altitude. That's why we can't hear him because maybe you are at a lower level. But God always speaks at his altitude and his altitude is hope. And here comes Isaiah, in the year his cousin dies, he presses into God instead of condescending to his own emotional uh, situation. He presses into God and he sees the Lord and he realizes that he's unclean in the presence of God. And he overheard a conversation in heaven. God wasn't even talking to him, he was eavesdropping. God was saying to the angels, who, who will go? Who, who's, going to, who's going to share my dream with the world? How will they know, he said, unless somebody says it? How will they be healed unless someone is sent? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here, I can imagine him under the firmament. Here I am. I can hear you. Send me. Hello, somebody. God wants to send you. He wants a fire to rise on the inside of you. But while you're living according to your present circumstances, looking at people who are on fire, telling them to calm down, instead of rising up in your own spirit and saying, me, here I am, send me. Sometimes your lack of passion is what's killing you. Your lack of passion makes you susceptible to temptation. When what's in you, it's not stronger than what's coming at you. You'll always give in to temptation. That's why you keep giving in to sin because your passion for your destiny is not as much as your passion for your selfish pleasures. Oh, I wasn't scared of you when you came into the room. I hope you know that. Your passion for your destiny needs to be more than your, the pain of your current situation. And that's why you need hope. That's why you need to stare at your hope. That's why if you're going to be obsessed with anything, be obsessed with hope. That's why you've got to write down your hope. You've got to put it on the wall where you can see it. You've got to put it on the mirror. Every time you look at the mirror, you've got to keep seeing your hope. You've got to place your hope before you. You've got to get obsessed with hope. Why? Because God said to Abraham, hey, Abraham, hey, Abraham, get out of your tent. Because your tent is limiting your potential. Get out of the place where you are. He said, look up because you can't look down right now. You can't look at things as they are. Look up. Count the stars. We need dreamers. We need people. Your dream upgrades you. Your dream mentors you. Your dream makes you more. Your job will never do that. Your job will keep you stupid. Your job will keep you dumb. Your job you will keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. But your dream demands your design. Hello, somebody. Church is for dreamers. We need oxygen. Ah. 
We need fuel. What's the fuel? What's the fuel? My time is almost up. What's the fuel? Romans chapter 12. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living... Oh, I need a church in here. Listen. Listen. I'm not going to calm down myself for you. How can I be this hot and you're that cold? A living sacrifice. Hmm, this is... Let's go to, let's see, Gracie. Hmm. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Hebrews 13, verse 15. I'm going to show you how to switch yourself on. Are you ready? Yes. Hebrews 13, 15. What does it say? Do we have it on the TV today? No. Hebrews 13, 15. What does it say? Everyone, Hebrews 13, verse 15, what it says, right on the screen. Let us, let us, let us, let us, let us sometimes, let us, let us when we're in church, let us, let us when we feel good, let us. Sometimes, sometimes, at all times, what are we meant to do? <laughs> Offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. I don't know why that word sacrifice is even there. <laughs> As if he's not worthy. It. But see, see, why does that put that word there? Because human beings are disgustingly ungrateful. Badly so. On every single level. Who gave you life that you're breathing? Just because you think medical science explains it, they still can't create it. Tell them to create the air they're explaining to you coming through your lungs. You're breathing in and out. You're not coughing up blood. You're alive. But see, let me tell you how we lose our fire and deactivate our spirit. I'll tell you exactly how the fire burns out. You complained once. And then you got addicted to complaining. Oh boy. This is, how you, this is how you switch yourself off. You deactivate your spirit. You created a cold environment for your heat. By complaining. And then you wondered why your fire went out. Look at the children of Israel. Oh man, look at this. They're in uh, Pharaoh's place. All of a sudden, Moses goes ahead. And he touches the water and it turns into blood. Pharaoh goes, okay, let him free, let him free, let him free. God's looking at the children of Israel to see if they're going to praise him for this mighty thing he's just done. You would think, if you saw God judging your enemies, man, some of you in here, you'd be like, yes, God, let him choke on snake and die. They who divorce, their marriage will never succeed. See? Arrows fire there. I was born and born, 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 born. Some of you were there. <laughs> God delivered you from burying people. Every day you're burying people. <laughs> Every day you're sending arrows back. Ignorance is so deadly. Every single time God's doing something good. 
Complaining is the first way to kill the fire of God. If there's any habit you want to kick in your life, it's complaining. See, already you're upset because I'm facing it away from you. Look at you right now. For you don't understand what I'm going through. For you don't understand what he went through on the cross, evidently. Because if you understood it, you would realize you have no right or reason to complain. If you know what you deserve and what God gave you instead. What does complaining do? Complaining is the breeding ground of offense. And offense is the breeding ground of all deception. Complaining is like me being in this big room with amazing things and complaining because that is wrong. Complaining always makes you see what's wrong instead of not what's right. And complaining, hear this, lowers your IQ drastically. Drastically. You become more stupid. Every single time you complain, more and more, just your brain cells are just dying, horrible death. The more and more you complain. Should I prove it? Here's a woman, and John the Baptist keeps prophesying to her every single day. It's wrong for you to take your husband's, uh, your brother's uh, husband. It's wrong because they had fornicated. And John the Baptist keeps pointing out this sin because he's the last prophet of the Old Testament. And he's pointing out this sin, this thing that they're doing that's wrong. And now she's upset with him. So she's looking for one day just to kill this man. One day Herodias is dancing before Herod. Herod's uh, young uh, niece is dancing before him. And she so pleased the heart of Herod through her dancing that Herod said this, ask me for anything. Up to half of my kingdom. You, you just didn't deep it. Ask me for anything. Even up to, if you want, you can have, you can become queen up to half. This girl who was nobody is about to become a ruler. But she listened to a bitter, old, complaining hag. Some of you are in danger of becoming that next door neighbor. Do you know the ones who, when you kick your football over, <laughs> complain? You're in danger of becoming just complain, complain, complain. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, life is awful. Oh, I just lost my job. Oh, this happened. Oh, that happened. You are forgetting every. You will not enjoy your life while you're complaining. Period. You are wiring your brain every time you complain to only see what's wrong. And look what she does. Um, let me finish the story. Look what she does. She listens to a bitter person, and the bitter person says this. Come, come. Ask for the head of John the Baptist. Ask me for anything. If she was intelligent, she would have asked for the half of the kingdom. Then John the Baptist is in. <laughs> and she would have had, I could have taught her that. If I was there, I'd say, come, stupid, come. Yeah. Come. Ask for the half the kingdom that John the Baptist is in. And if she has half the kingdom, she has wealth. Send some assassins. But offense lowers your IQ so much, you become unresourceful. While you're complaining, you don't see possibilities. Whilst you're complaining, you are choking the oxygen of hope. And yet, believers have more hope than the world. Believers have a vertical hope. We don't need to horizontally navigate our way through life. We have a God who steps into the midst of situations. That's why I say desire is the same as desire, because let me tell you how to stir back up your hope. Learn to praise. 
No, 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 you don't understand. Learn to pray. I learned how to praise from my friend Caleb. He's in church today. I learned how to praise from him. I'm, I'm in, well, he comes to my house every morning, 6 a.m. on a Tuesday. We have to do Monday this week because I fly out on Tuesday. Cool. So he comes to my house every week on a, on a Tuesday. And we, we get to pray. And I learned something actually from another friend of mine who's in church today. Re- Rebecca McKenzie did something. She, I called her on the phone. I said, how do I lose weight? Because she seems to shred quite easily. I said, how do I do it? What do I need to do? So she said, this is what you do. Divide your plate into percentages. She said, have, I just thought this is already boring, but anyway. <laughs> have a percentage of, your, this is the percentage of your plate. This should be protein. I said to her already, that's too small. <laughs> I mean, it, this should be protein. She said, this should be protein. This should be carbs. And this should be vegetable. <laughs> I said, wrong number. Boo! You know, <laughs> show me this. And, I, and then I kept, my brain connected that with when I'm praying with Caleb. If you ever have a prayer time with Caleb, it's amazing. We play music in the morning. We just play, he plays some music on his little phone or something connected to the speaker. And you'll see this guy go, oh, God, we just praise you. You're just awesome. And then he gets to growling. He's like, oh, God, you're amazing. Oh. And then he starts reminding God of who God is. He says, you're the same God. Oh, you bought it. Then I get involved. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, and God, you raised Lazarus from the dead. After four days dead, you shook the grave and hell. And then I said, oh, you're Alpha. You're Omega. You're beginning. You're the end. Oh, man. And then something on the inside. Woo. Something starts to wake up. At first, it's like, yeah, God, you're amazing, hallelujah. It's a sacrifice at first. because It's a sacrifice because I don't feel like doing it. Oh, God, I praise you at first. And it sounds repetitive. Hallelujah. It did not say praise God with the fruit of your heart. It said praise God with the fruit of your Because your mouth ignites fire. That's what James says. James says it's a tongue that sets the course of one's destiny on fire. Your mouth is an ignition chamber. If you want this fire to go off again, you've got to learn to speak words that get you ignited again. But you missed the most powerful part about praise. What praise does for you. You say, well, why would somebody pray? I'm learning the secrets of praise the more I praise God. Because desire is linked to design. Genesis 1, 26, when God made man, he made him in his own, after his likeness. Oh, man, I want to give you a principle of praise. You become what you praise. You get with me for a second. This is the third chapter. Moses says, who shall I say has sent me? God says, I am who I am. I'll be who I'll be. The Bible says it like this in 1 John. It says, beloved, we don't yet know what will be, but all we know is when we see him, we will be like him. For as he is, so A man without a praise life is a man without a mirror. Praise doesn't just remind God who he is. But praise reminds you because of who he is, who you are. So God is walking with his son, with his, Jesus is walking with his disciples. And he says, who do you say that I am? Am. So some say you're this, some say you're that. Peter looks and says, he releases a praise. He says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And look at this, Jesus said, and I tell you. When you and I praise God, God begins to activate within us that which we praise him about. And God said, and I tell you, you are now a piece of the rock. And on this rock I will build my church. 
and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Praise doesn't just reveal God, but you learn how to praise properly. Praise will reveal you. Because if you know, God says, and now I am that I am. Uh, now hear this. He said, and now I am sending you. No, you missed it. Because in the original Hebrew, it does not say, I am sending you. In the original Hebrew, it says, I am that I am. And now I am sent. I need to speak to the right church. He says, he said, because you are now here, before all I could do was watch and do nothing. But now I am sent. So as you go, I am is being sent. But see, see, see. Somebody said to me, they said, it's my revelation that leads to my experience. As I'm praising God, I get a revelation of Him. Your revelation is different from mine. He said, I am that I am. I'll be what I'll be. God has always limited Himself to man. This is why He couldn't wait for Jesus to come. Because Jesus showed God unlimited. But God has always limited Himself to your opinion about Him. He said, I am that I am. I'll be whatever I'll be. This is, the, this is the problem here. Some of you have handcuffed God. Some of you have shackled the forces of heaven. Even if they wanted to do great things. Oh man, if this caused trouble on Twitter, I'm about to cause more. There are some things God cannot do. Let me prove it because you look funny. Let me prove it. And I'll leave you alone here. I'll leave you alone here once I've proved it. Um, I had it out. I had it written down, but I can't read my writing. Wouldn't it be cool if I just left you alone like this? Put it out on Twitter and... There are some things God cannot do. Full stop. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, uh, Matthew 13, verse 15. Matthew 13. From verse 50, I think. It's a long chapter, so we'll move down. <laughs> Matthew 13, verse, from verse 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there, coming to his hometown. Verse 54. Are you there on the screen? Coming to his hometown, he began teaching people. He taught in their synagogue so that they were amazed with, be, and bewildered with wonder and said, where did this man get the wisdom and these miraculous powers? Look at this. Is not this the carpenter's son? Hear it. I am that I am. I'll be what I be. Blank check. Is not this the carpenter's son? Oh, when you get this, there are miracles God wants to do in your life. But because you are treating God with familiarity, even the fact that you don't want to pray is already evidence that you don't know him. Because if you knew who he is, you'd be in prayer every day of your life. You, they, they handcuffed God. They said, isn't this just... That carpenter's apprentice? Is we know his mom. We know Maza. Maza. 
Isn't it Mazda that just lives down the road? Uh-uh. Auntie Mary, that we ain't. We know her. See, some of you are like, isn't this just like London? Isn't this just a church like every other church? Whatever you treat with familiarity will never empower you. Whatever you dishonor, you will never benefit from. Honor is the ability to treat with difference. Honor is the, the reason why I don't high-five the queen. Honor always brings favor. Always. Always. 